Um, Val Hall, Cat Robinson Greeter, Elizabeth Sarles and I are in charge of putting together a service for our congregation once a month. And I have to say, it's one of my favorite things to do as a member of the UU congregation. Um, it, it gives our beloved Rev Linda a monthly break from leading the service. And it gives us a chance as congregants to bring service themes to life that are of interest to us and, and we think may be of interest to you as well. Um, speaking of which, if you have a service theme that has been percolating in your head and would like to see it perhaps come to life in a service, just let us know. We'd be more than happy to work on it with you. Um, you don't have to be a member of the committee to share and work on an idea for the lay led service. So get in touch with us if you have something that you've been thinking about. I don't know about you, but I'm so happy to be able to come together as a community twice in the last four days. Our Christmas Eve service was so wonderful with the beautiful music, the poem and the candle lighting. Um, hopefully this may be the start of a new tradition for us as a congregation. I, I know I'll be pushing for it with Rev Linda and Nigel and Sue. Um, and speaking of traditions, the pandemic that we're currently experiencing has definitely shaken up some of our beloved traditions, but it seems to me as I've been talking with friends from within and without the UU congregation, that most of us have bravely moved forward, creating ways to celebrate long-standing holiday traditions and coming up with new pandemic traditions. We thought that having the service would be a good way to explore these old and new traditions within our congregation. Before we go forward, are there any announcements? Yes, Val, you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, our next lay led service is January 24th. And the theme of the service is going to be, I want to age like sea glass, which was, uh -huh. a, poem which was a poem written by Bernadette Knoll. And um, I would love to have some volunteers representing each decade of life, of adult life, uh, who would um, think about, uh, I can send you the, the whole thing if you get in touch with me and I'll put my email in, your, in, in the chat. Uh, I want to age like sea glass. I want to enjoy the journey and let my preciousness be, not in spite of the impacts of life, but because of them. So if you can reflect on that, and if you think you'd like to be involved in spending a minute or so uh, talking about that, uh, just get in touch with me. Thank you. Thanks, Val. Any other announcements? Mm -hmm. I don't see any. Hey, I, I'm waving my hand, Susan. Okay. You're right in front of me. I <laughs> um, just a couple things. Um, one is that um, we are well on our way. We're almost at the end of the year. Um, we've, um, sorry, this is just a reminder to, if you haven't sent your pledge in um, yet, um, please do so. We're we're concluding our budgeting for um, next fiscal year, and we're um, our pledges have been coming in um, well. But um, we just want to make sure that everybody is counted, and we can um, then know how to plan for the for the coming year. So that's that's my main um, announcement. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, so if everybody would like to unmute themselves and we will light the chalice together with Peter. Peter's new, you can't put the computer that will help us. Just hold it up. Okay, so the words are in the table. Um, and together we can say, as Peter lights the candle, lift it up, please, Peter. Um, with this flame, we, we renew, renew our, our commitment. commitment. Justice, peace, and compassion. Let's stay unmuted. And now is the time in the service where we sing together our affirmation as printed in your order of service. And I see some new faces out there, so I'll just uh, let everybody know this can be tricky to follow, but uh, we do our best to sing together over Zoom, and it's short. So follow along as best you can. From all that dwell below the skies, let faith and hope with love arise. Let beauty, truth, and good be sung through every land by every tongue. From all that dwell below the skies, let faith 
Muted. Now's the time in the service when we greet each other, um, Zoom style. But first, is there anyone, and I do see some, so I hope we get introduced to you, um, who are coming to our service for the first time or who is returning after an extended absence? Now introduce yourselves. Um, look at me. I'm hearing it. Oh, oh down here. Okay. Is it Kathy? Kathy? Kathy, yes. I'm here from uh, UU Falmouth. There's okay. about five or six of us. <laughs> Welcome. Morning, Welcome. Kathy. Hi. Thank Hi. you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Anybody else? My name is Christine, and I'm also from UU Falmouth, and thank you for having us. Okay. Oh, Welcome, Christine. Thank you. Good morning, Kathy. Anybody else? Amy. Me? And McKelway from Brewster. Our staff is taking uh, the day off. So uh, I got the uh, Zoom link from uh, Susan Carey. Nice. Great. Welcome. Okay. Welcome. I'm Susan Brooks, and I'm from UU Falmouth also. Wow. And it's nice to be here this morning. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. I love Welcome. you. Seasons. The more seasons, the merrier. Welcome, Susan. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jim Lydia Strand from uh, UU Falmouth, too. Oh, <laughs> Lydia Strand? No, I mean, uh, yeah, but what, not even the same name. No, Strand. Um, anybody else? Hayden, I yeah. Hayden Joanne Grinnell from UU Falmouth. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, hello. Great. Uh, welcome. Hello. Nice to have you. Who's the hamster? Susan. <laughs> Susan. <laughs> Oh, you're <laughs> Sarah. 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 Okay. Hi, hamster. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Am I missing any? We have two screens, so I'm sorry if I'm missing hand waving here, but um, okay. So let's please take a minute to just say hello to each other. <laughs> Jeff May, who is a UUer, um, called Gathering in Our Own Spaces. It's also can be a meditation as well. So take a deep breath. 
come, gather, not into a common space, sharing a physical closeness we long for, precluded by wise choice, but come, gather into this common time and a common space. We need to be together. We yearn for connection. We hunger for the familiar faces of friends, the sound of shared voices proclaiming who we are, where we are going, that which resonates with our hopes, our dreams, our values. Come, gather. We are here in this space made of all spaces and we share our becoming in this moment. And on to holiday traditions, part one. Um, we've gotten a few of you who have um, decided that you can uh, share a holiday um, tradition with us. Um, I've divided it into two parts. Uh, three of us will share a holiday tradition that is meaningful to us in this segment and three in the second part, maybe two. I've deliberately placed the joys and concerns section of our service towards the end. So if you are inspired by hearing about these traditions, you can share yours during that time. We'll have our usual joys and concerns, but then follow it up with any other holiday traditions you might have. Um, perhaps as I've stated in my welcome, you've created a new holiday tradition that you would like to share. Um, that's fine too. And now our youngest at heart member, maybe some, makes me feel like, a, a, an older person, but Joanne is going to share her first holiday, um, our first holiday tradition. And so Joanne, I'm gonna remind you to unmute yourself and we'll see where you are. Right, is this right? Yes, you sound good. Okay, good. Well, in my family, we celebrate the Feast of the Seven Fishes on Christmas Eve. The celebration was brought to the New World by the Italian immigrants that thronged the gates of Ellis Island in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. For 32 years, my daughter-in-law Liz has choreographed this culinary extravaganza to the eager anticipation and delight of family and friends. So what is the Feast of the Seven Fishes? Italy wasn't always Italy. Prior to 1870, on completion of the unification or the Risorgimento, Italy was a conglomerate of eight city-states, each with its own customs, traditions, cuisine, laws, dialects, and even languages. Today's Italian is actually the dialect of Florence. Hmm. The Feast of the Seven Fishes is essentially the celebration on Christmas Eve by people from Southern Italy, a poor and impoverished region then and now. In addition to the religious aspect, the Feast of the Seven Fishes is a, is a time for Italians to celebrate what they hold most dear, family, friends, and food. Or maybe I should say family, food, and friends. It is a joyous and merry time. So why seven fishes? From ancient times, seven has been considered a sacred and magic number, and even today carries lucky weight. For example, there are seven days of creation, seven deadly sins, seven seas, and for Catholics, seven sacraments. It is said that the number seven appears 700 times in the Bible. And why fish instead of beef or fowl? Fishing was the economy in this part of Italy and fish the mainstay of the diet. It also reflects Christ's promise to the fishermen he was trying to recruit who were plying their, <coughs> their nets in the Galilee. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Thus fish became the symbol of the early Christian church. The penitential aspect of the feast, fish instead of meat or fowl, 
lies in the tradition of sacrifice before a major ritual or event, a sort of cleansing to prepare for renewal. Some of you may remember when Catholics couldn't eat meat on Friday, it was considered a sin. It was, it was conducted in mem memory of Christ's crucifixion. My daughter-in-law, Liz, whose family comes from Southern Italy, has perpetuated the tradition of the feast. As a very young child helping and learning recipes and techniques in the kitchens of grandmother, mother, and aunt. For 32 years, thanks to her indefatigable energy and love, she has offered this extraordinary gift to family and friends. So what's on the menu? It may vary slightly from year to year, but there are tried and true traditional dishes. To begin, sitting around a cozy fire, sipping wine, friends and family nibble on bacala, that's cod, and potato spread, or maybe mini crab cakes, or a salmon and fennel dip. Drifting to the table, we scratch away at our lottery tickets, which Liz has generously supplied as place markers. We are greeted with the first course, mountains of mussels in, in a wine and a light tomato sauce. After which comes the inevitable pasta. This time it's with walnuts, anchovies, and olive oil to be followed by a mixed seafood sally, salad containing squid, octopus, shrimp, and scungeal, which is uh, conch. Perhaps the next course would include a uh, fry shrimp, a flounder with pignoli nuts and currants, or tilapia with green olives. Alternates might be stuffed flounder, shrimp and fennel risotto. I've lost count. Needless to say, we do not eat at one go. Between courses, people get up, walk around the house, or go for a walk, or catch a bit of football on TV. In recent years, as the midnight mass tradition has faded away in many parishes, uh, we take the final course, which is dessert, around the fireplace, sipping espresso laced with amaretto, chipping away at heaps of strafuli, which is fried dough rolled in honey and nuts, panettone, panettone, uh, Italian fruitcake, and a bounty of extravagant and gaily colored pastry. But in the old days, dessert was served when we returned from midnight mass. The feast, feast would start late in the afternoon and amble on until late in the evening. Finally, as the seven league marathon drew to a close, we would put on our hats and coats and troop off to attend midnight mass, walking to the church through the silent, still and starlit streets. Wow, beautiful, Joanne. <laughs> It's a beautiful feast. I know. I don't know how you stay so slim. <laughs> it's a year. <laughs> it's only once a year. Once a year. Okay. Well, I thank you for sharing that. I'm glad it's recorded. So people's mouths were watering. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to go next with one of my two holiday traditions that I share with my family. And I'm hoping that Elizabeth can at some point during this share um, the picture. Oh, okay. This is um, a scene that's right in our family right now. Um, I was brought up in a family that celebrated both Hanukkah and Christmas. And we love celebrating both with the Jewish and Christian sides of our family. As an early childhood educator, I could always see what a special appeal the nativity had for children. What could be better than being born in a barn surrounded by animals, angels, and assorted wise men bringing you gifts? And sure enough, my son Parker loved the whole nativity story. I found plenty of picture books to share with him about it. And one magical Christmas, I think he was around four, his uncle Henry gave him a whole nativity scene to set up and arrange however he wanted. It wasn't the holiday season until Parker's nativity scene came out. 
He loved playing with it, and he always found space to add his other love to the scene, his matchbox cars, which you can see here in the scene. Um, he loved to park them amongst the animals and the figures of his crush. And it still comes out every holiday season. It wouldn't be cr Christmas, Hanukkah without it. And the matchbox cars always magically appear at some point as well. A Richard's tradition. And there it is. And that matchbox truck in the middle is like a f one from his great, great grandfather or something. It's a real, I'm sure there's lead paint on it. That little yellow pickup truck. Yeah. Is it a tow truck? Thank you. Yeah, it might be a tow truck. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. And we're going to go on to our third of this uh, session. Um, Kat is going to share some memories, some traditions. Okay, hold on. Bear with me a second. I need to share my screen. And figure out how to also read my thing at the same time. <laughs> um, so before um, my mom and I moved to Nantucket when I was eight, we lived in several Camp Hill communities, primarily one in upstate New York where my grandparents lived. Camp Hill Village is one of many intentional communities around the world that were developed based on the philosophy of Rudolf Steiner, who also created Waldorf education. In these communities, people with developmental disabilities and those without live and work together. Usually the communities include biodynamic farms, dairy farms, bakeries, and craft workshops. Christmas was very different in Camp Hill Village, unlike secular celebrations that focus on Christmas Day. At Camp Hill, the whole 12 days of Christmas are recognized until the three kings arrive on January 6th. The tree is brought in, set up, and decorated on Christmas Eve and remains for just the 12 days. And instead of lights and glittery ornaments, most trees were decorated very simply with red apples, white and red roses, handmade ornaments like stars, like stars made of straw and real candles. They are also adorned with ornaments of esoteric anthroposophical symbols. So I wanna show you a few pictures of that are kind of similar to um, trees that I grew up with in my childhood. Um, you can see this one is not lit. This is, this is actually a tree in the hall in the community that I grew up with. Um, somebody lighting the large tree in the, um, celebration hall. So, um, and then I think I might have another couple of, nope, maybe not. All right. So I'll leave this one up while I continue talking. Um, it was magical as a child to gather around the tree each night after dinner. The electric lights were extinguished and the candles lit with a taper. We sang Christmas carols, the traditional ones. On Christmas Eve, my grandfather always read his English translation of the German translation from the original Swedish. Legend of the Christmas Rose by Selma Lagerlof. The story is about an abbot who convinces the wife of an outlawed robber who has been exiled to the forest to allow him to visit on Christmas Eve. After she tells him that to celebrate the birth of Christ each year, the forest is transformed into a garden far more beautiful than the one that the abbot has carefully cultivated behind the walls of the monastery. The abbot is intrigued and requests a pardon for the robber and his family from the archbishop who is skeptical, but says he will grant it if the abbot brings him a flower from the garden. On Christmas Eve, the abbot is in great excitement and a lay brother who is extremely skeptical travel through the snow and cold deep into the forest to the cave where the robber family live. 
just as the robber mother told him. At midnight, they run outside as the snow melts, flowers bloom, tame animals appear, and the singing of angels fills the air. The abbot is overcome with joy and peace, but the lay brother believes it is the work of the devil because God would never perform this miracle for the outcasts and criminals living in the forest. So he shouts a curse, and at once the forest begins to revert to winter. The abbot is so shocked and distressed, but remembers his promise to the archbishop and scrabbles at the ground as it freezes back up before he succumbs to a heart attack and dies. When his body is returned to the monastery, the lay brother discovers two bulbs clutched in the abbot's frozen hand. And full of remorse, he plants them in the garden, but they do not grow. The following Christmas, he discovers that the bulbs have produced beautiful flowers in the middle of winter and takes them to the archbishop, who then grants a pardon to the robber family. But the forest never again turns into a garden at Christmas, and the lay brother goes to live in the cave where the robber family used to live. It has been many, many years since I've been back to the village for Christmas. Both my grandparents are no longer with us. I don't consider myself to be Christian, and I decorate my artificial tree with lights and lots of ornaments, but I do find I have a preference for the small white lights and handmade ornaments and traditional Christmas carols, probably because they remind me of childhood. Thank you, Kat. Thank you very much. It's lovely. Um, okay, we're going to go on to, um, I think it's Nigel and our middle hymn. Yeah. Uh, today I've chosen um, a hymn that we sang quite a bit earlier this year. This is number 1020, Woyaya. Woyaya is an African word from the language of Ga that means we are going. And the lyrics to this are short, so I'll read them just in case you don't have them handy, although Elizabeth did drop them in the chat earlier. Uh, we are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within, and we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. It'll be hard, we know, and the road will be muddy and rough, but we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will.
you. I love that one. I'd almost forgotten. Okay, we're into holiday tra traditions part two. Um, and we are still, it's still um, all about girl power here because we're going on to Val. Val is going to share her tradition and also I think some pictures too. Yeah. Okay, Elizabeth, you have the pictures. Okay. Um, this is uh, Hall's Silly Christmas Pictures. Um, one of our favorite holiday traditions, uh, it's, which dates back into the 80s and 90s, was started by Bob. He prepares a scallop shell every Christmas to put on our tree with all the names of all the peoples and, uh, people and animals who are gathered that year. Uh, next one. Uh, this has continued up into the new millennium. Next. Uh, he now also makes these ornaments for our children and their families to put on their trees. Next. Bob, being the photographer he is, is always taking a group pic a Christmas picture, making sure to include any animals in the household, of course. Next. Uh, at first they were pretty serious, but soon the kids started getting silly. Danny was with us that Christmas, but just gave his melt in your heart smile. Uh, after our first grandchild came into the world in 2009, the group photos became very silly. Of course, little Avia was just a cute lump back then. By the time Avia was three, she started getting into the goofy spirit, as you can see. Uh, soon, uh, she showed that she could be just as silly as the adults. Okay. At age four, she perfected the technique, although that year she was a little outdone by the rest of us and distracted by her new bike. 2018 was a big year for us, first spending Christmas with brother Danny in Florida, but no matter how silly Bob and I got, Danny just gave his winning smile. Then grandson Aaron came into the world in 2018. His first Christmas in Sharon was a bit overwhelming for him, but he did tolerate us decorating him up a bit. Next one. By his next Christmas, Aaron still couldn't quite figure out why everyone was looking so weird. And of course, this Christmas by Zoom, he got right into it. He finally figured it out. And finally, I'll end with this picture. Now, in case you can't recognize what this is, it's Yorkshire pudding, a traditional part of our roast beef Christmas dinner. Last year, daughter Emily baked it in her own kitchen, and I think she really captured its essence, don't you? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Val. <laughs> in the spirit of silliness, I'm going to do my second um, um, holiday tradition, uh, and it's very silly actually, but, and we don't, it's so silly. I don't even have a picture for it. But um, as I said, we all, we celebrate Hanukkah along with Christmas in our family. Um, so when the nativity scene comes out, so does the menorah. As a new parent back in the nineties, I thought a lot about how to bring Hanukkah to life for my little boy. It's hard for Hanukkah to compete with Christmas. So what I came up with was an idea that was inspired by a Saturday night live skit um, with a character named Hanukkah Harry, played by John Lovitz, you might remember him, um, who took over on Christmas Eve when Santa came down with the flu. Instead of reindeer, his sleigh was pulled by three donkeys named Moisha, Herschel, and Shlomo. Um, for our Hanukkah Harry, I enlisted, this was in Vermont, we lived in Vermont for 30 years, uh, a good friend who on the first night of Hanukkah would drop off a plain paper bag um, at the front door, which Parker would discover. Um, there were eight gifts in the bag and Parker would pick just one on every night of Hanukkah after we lit the candles and said the prayers. As an adult, fairly recently, Parker did confess to me that as he got older, he started wondering about why Hanukkah Harry never visited any of his friends' houses. The magic of Hanukkah. 
So that's another tradition that we have. <laughs> and I think we're going to our third um, entry is going to be a few pictures um, that people have shared, sent in and shared with us that Elizabeth is going to share. Um, I don't know if people who shared these want to unmute themselves or we can just look at them quietly. Um, um, but if you do want to um, say something about them, you can unmute yourself and say something. So here we go. Hmm. This looks like it looks, must be Linda's family. So this one, Linda Ferrantella sent in. Nice. And I'm sorry, clicking. Uh, Laura and Paul sent this one in. Bigfoot uh, red pajamas. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the strands want to unmute for some of these. Um, yeah. I've got a few captions, but not very many. I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, so we've always, um, I grew up all over the world and um, one of the traditions in our house was uh, the, the um, it's after Christmas, you put your shoes out in front of, of your door and um, and and you get something in your shoes, and it was always in in Mexico. The youngest person is always very very important in the house. You know, children are are just incredibly important, and so in our house, very early on, we started having the youngest person who's living with us um, put the ornament, the angel on the top of the tree. So that year was, I think I. I said it was uh, 2013 or 2014, and Liam was the youngest person. And then the next picture, you'll see who the, that was the youngest person. And she was not con that interested in putting the angel on the tree. She wanted to eat the angel. Um, so <laughs> we put it quickly on the top of the tree. <laughs> uh, she still wants to eat the angel. Um, the next um, thing, we are kind of very much into books and every Christmas Eve, we all climb into the bed. Whoever's in the house, everybody has to climb into a bed together. And Brad reads the book that he got um, in 1960. It was copyright in 1960. And um, that's what happens on Christmas Eve. And you can see how happy Liam was about that. Um, <laughs> Oh, and fun. there's one more. Um, so uh, what Joanne said about uh, family, food, and friends um, is very much part of our, our life, too. So this one is a breakfast strata. There's actually a, a, an R in there. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I was doing this right before service. Oh, yeah, no worries. No worries. <laughs> I, it could have been me typing it wrong. I send it to you like it one in the morning, I think. Um, but anyway, um, we have champagne at night and we make the breakfast strata, you stick it in the fridge and then it kind of all melds together and you put it, Brad puts it in, in the oven in the morning um, and, and we all wake up to the smell of this baking egg and cheese and bread. Um, and if I have my way, spinach or broccoli goes in there, but um, I usually don't. Um, <laughs> And then the last picture, if it got in there, is of saltwater taffy. Um, we have friends over when it's not Pandemic. what it is. <laughs> and we make um, saltwater taffy. Um, it's a recipe from Brad's mother. And Brad is super good at not having um, boiling sugar burn people. Um, so he handles the, what's the thing called? The ball um, of sugar that it starts as a ball of sugar and then you pour it in a tray and you pull it and pull it and pull it in case you guys have ever done it. There's butter and sugar and people everywhere. And um, it's a lot of fun. And maybe next year we'll share that tradition with you because you need a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so one of my Christmas traditions is that we pull out my grandfather's um, electric trains from uh, that he got when he was little. We've added some new ones over the years. 
um, my sister and I put the little koala on the, the coal loader and the coal loader actually does load coal and then stick it out the other side. Um, and we use corn kernels for that. Um, it makes a very somewhat loud clanking noise as it goes around. Um, but we, we always get that out under the Christmas tree and um, grandpa gets his original ones out and, and usually gets those going by the end of Christmas. Sometimes they're too heavy and you have to take the, the top off the train so that it can go around um, and make it all the way around the track. Um, and then our other one is to make Christmas tree bread. Um, and it's got uh, dried fruit that we've somewhat rehydrated with um, some, a little bit of orange and peel and um, sugar. And then we put that inside of the sweet dough bread and roll it up and, and make a tree. So that is our last one. Okay. Oh, and I'm not muted anymore. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm sure at this point in the service, Reb Linda would be saying something really profound and, and beautiful and spiritual about um, all these traditions. All I can say is I love hearing about them. And I, I could literally spend the rest of the day listening to everybody. If everybody wanted to just spend some time, I love hearing about them. So thank you for sharing. Um, we're going to um, have a little bit of time. If anybody has um, traditions after our joys and concerns, that would be fine. Um, and we're going to go into, um, Kat is going to be featured for our gifts we bring. Um, she's going to have some words to say, and then we have a real special treat coming up for the offertory. I'll let Kat take over. Um, as this very difficult and often depressing year of um, sometimes uh, frustration, anger, and fear draws to a close, I invite you to consider what this community has meant to you as you make your offering this morning. UU congregations are democratic and independent. We are the church, the meeting house. We receive what we give. Your contribution of time, talent, and financial resources allow this community to be what it is. Thank you for your generosity this year that has allowed us to maintain and even grow our community during this time of isolation. Please be as generous as you are able. The morning offering will now be gratefully received. And I'll just share quickly, I put in the chat, um, the website that you can go to as well as the PO box if you would like to do a chat, uh, check. Um, if you, when you go to unitarianchurchnantucket.org, um, you can click receive updates if you would like to, to receive the newsletter each week. Um, on the top right, there's the contribute and the text to give, which brings us to Tithely and down at the bottom, there's PayPal if you scroll all the way to the bottom. When you click on the contribute, you get taken to the Tithely account. You can choose what, um, what you would like to select. Um, we have Sunday offering pledge um, for this past year and this upcoming one and gift. Um, you can make it a recurring gift as you, if you would like, um, and uh, make sure to click the cover fees if you are using a credit card. Um, you can also log in and, and change the selections. Um, and on the website, it, it will give you a, help you through with the pledge um, if you would like to see that. So with that, we have a very nice piece, Susan and and uh, I'm really excited to uh, hear Susan and Ray this morning, our very own. And I just wanted to say real quick before they uh, perform for us today that if you have not checked out the fantastic recording of this next song, please do so. So with that, I'll turn it over to Susan and Ray. Thank you, Nigel. And it's been wonderful hearing about everybody's traditions and it's inspiring us to think about reviving some. Uh, this song uh, came out of Ray's lament that he might not see his children at Christmas. And uh, we had a wonderful Christmas despite just seeing Jake. And uh, we will excuse ourselves from coffee hour today because we will be meeting up with Ray's daughter and her fiance in a park 
socially distanced to do a little celebration. So anyway, we hope you enjoy this song this year. Jane came home from college. Jake rode out on the train. John drove down from Brooklyn. But this year is not the same. Our family celebrations were filled with Yuletide cheer. We gather and make merry. Maybe not this year. This year, one like no other. This year, we long to embrace. This year, we may not be in one place, but our love comes from the heart. We'll send our season's greetings from afar. Jane's been home for months now. Class is moved online. Jake's job was cut. John's office is shut. This year's been unkind. My mom and dad don't venture out. Risks are too severe. Seems such a shame it won't be the same without my folks this year. This year, one like no other. This year, we long to embrace. This year, we may not be in one place, but our love comes from the heart. We'll send our season's greetings from afar. Spirits bright, a card, a text, a call. Distance at the holidays, the hottest part of all. process. We're always looking for new voices. And all you need is uh, a couple of little devices, one to record yourself on and one to listen to the music on. So um, it's always an open, open invitation. Build a common good. 
guest Linda Sperry, um, kind of stepping in for Mary Beth, who wasn't able to read our poem today. So thank you, Linda, for stepping forward and, and doing this poem for us. Happy to do so. And for our friends from Falmouth, I'm coming to you from a little further west than, than Falmouth, from Southern California. So uh, I think we get the prize for the most distance today, but uh, we're glad you were here. And also I see someone from Brewster. So you can join from anywhere, anytime you want to for the Sunday services. The name of this poem is In the Time of the Virus by Elizabeth C. Heron. In the fullness of time, you said, by which I remembered, all life is vibration, a sine wave, an ebb and flow. Even a virus has rhythm, gathering and tightening, loosening and letting go. On the valley oaks, the nubs of leaves are promise of shade. In the orchards, blossoms promise apples. And in the fullness of time, you will bend to see your granddaughter's first smile, the gap where your grandson lost his first tooth. In the fullness of time, we will greet and hold each other close as the season's light and shadows close as the fingers of my hand raised now to wave to you. Can we get there? Oh, not needed. Thank you, Linda. I love the wave at the end. Thank you. Um, so now it's time to extinguish our chalice. Peter will do the honors of lifting it up so you can see it. Mm -hmm. And um, we will, you can unmute yourselves, please, so we can say together carry, carry the, the flame, flame of peace until we meet again. Nigel gets, uh, you'll notice on the, if you printed out your back, your program, or if you looked at it online, you'll see that the uh, the words in the back of the program are the lyrics, some of the lyrics to Auld Lang Syne. All right, I'm going to mute all, Nigel. Yeah, so for the postlude today, I'll be playing Old Lang Syne, short and sweet. And uh, if you'd like to sing along, go for it. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, everyone who contributed today and who came to be with us today. And Happy New Year to all of you. Um, and please feel free to stay on for our breakout room 